Well, it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce the speaker for, for this session. I wasn't here when Caitlin introduced the staff of the Love and Fidelity Network, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cassie Huff, and I'm the founder and senior advisor to the Love and Fidelity Network. In the years that I've been working with Love and Fidelity, of course, I've seen the type of sex education that exists at today's colleges and universities. And now that I'm a parent to a child approaching school age, sex education as it exists at the primary and secondary school levels and the curriculum that is often pushed has become a matter of greater concern and urgency for me, as I'm sure you can imagine. You now, whether you're a college student trying to make sense of the sexual uh, landscape before you, or whether you're a parent wondering how it is that schools are educating our children about sex to begin with, a discussion about the forces behind sex education becomes very valuable and appreciated. So here to enlighten that discussion for us is Valerie Huber. Valerie is the president and CEO of the National Abstinence Education Association, a Washington, D.C.-based professional association in support of abstinence education as the optimal strategy for teen sexual health. Valerie previously served as the Title V abstinence, educator coordinator, abstinence Education Coordinator for the state of Ohio, where she provided oversight and grant awards to community abstinence programs serving over 100,000 students per year as part of the Ohio Department of Health. She is a frequent spokesperson for teen sexual health in various media venues and has been interviewed hundreds of times by prominent print, radio, television outlets. She's an expert on the history of sex education as well as the public policy decision making that has influenced how sex education is taught in communities across the nation. Please join me in welcoming Valerie. Thank you, Kathy. Well, thank you. And I have a caveat uh, when we, as we start, just to tell you that I am not a philosopher. I am not a social scientist, although we use social science research all the time. Um, we are really involved at the grassroots level. And by the grassroots level, um, I mean that the National Abstinence Education Association is really a professional association that helps those who provide sex education in the schools and in communities to do it well. In addition to that, we help to craft public policy at the national level. So we have a bill that's introduced in Congress right now and has about 75 co-sponsors. We host congressional briefings on Capitol Hill. We have regular meetings uh, with members of Congress, uh, with the White House, with governor's offices, with state legislatures, things such as that to assure that young people receive optimal health outcomes when they um, are in sex education classes. So that's kind of where we are. I put this picture up here. Um, probably know that's the White House. Our office is located right directly across from the White House complex. So this is kind of the view from our window a little bit. And it's a different world in Washington, DC. Um, we can talk about many of the things that we, we have discussed and listened to over the, the last 24 hours, and they make perfect sense to us. Um, but we are the choir. And I will tell you that when we're having this conversation in the general public, um, it takes on a, a life of its own. And we have to talk about things differently and in a way that can resonate with those who may not have a faith perspective, who may not think of sex education in any way other than pregnancy prevention for teens. And so that is kind of the world that we are living in, and yet we are trying to infuse many of the things that we have been t hearing about over this last 24 hours into that policy, but in a winsome way that is understood by policymakers who may not exactly be on the same page that we are. Well, when we're doing that, um, it, it occurred to me that it's really important to know where we came from in terms of sex education and why should we even care? Not everybody's a history buff like me, but as I spent time in the Library of Congress looking at original documentation, for when the US government first got involved in sex education, it occurred to me that a lot has not changed. In fact, it was quite surprising why we got involved in sex education as a nation at all. 
I'll be the first one to acknowledge that it should be parents who are the primary sex educators of our children, not the federal government, not the schools. So why on earth did we get involved? And is there any way of reversing that? Those are a couple of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So even if you're not that interested in history, and I'm going to suppose that since you're here, maybe you are, <laughs> but even if you're not, it's really important for us to know history because as Shakespeare aptly said, what is past is prologue. It's really important to know where we came from because that influences and contextualizes the present. So that's the history part of what we're going to be talking about. But then there's also the histrionics part. And I will tell you that that's the world I live in too. Because if you think about this issue just from a solely objective level, why would anyone want young people to experiment sexually? Middle schoolers, even high schoolers. It doesn't make sense, and yet the most heated debates in certain congressional uh, committee rooms are over the issue of sex education, even though it's a tiny portion of the federal government. In fact, one committee chair came to me at one time, and this is someone who is not particularly supportive even of abstinence education, and he said, could you please meet with this member of Congress? Because whenever we talk about abstinence education, do I need to turn this off or anything? I know it's annoying me, so I'm sure it is you as well. So there's nothing we can do? Well, we'll just keep talking. See, histrionics, <laughs> even now. <laughs> anyway, this member of Congress would actually go in the halls of Congress, get up on the committee table where, where they were discussing priorities for the next year, and stomp his feet and yell in, in an animosity against abstinence education. And this was the single issue that got the most um, debate, even though it was the smallest amount of money that they argued about. And so it doesn't make sense, and yet there are a lot of histrionics as well. And here are some examples of some of the things that you can just find very quickly on why people are against young people waiting to have sex. And what I found that as we went through history, that there is this fine red thread of things that are very common from the very start. So we're going to be talking about some things that are turning points. And in order for them to be turning points, they have to do three things and satisfy these. Number one, they have to have been influential in the culture of their time, even if it was a subcultural view. Secondly, it had to have a continuing influence on our society. And third, it had to have a continuing influence on sex education currently. Would you like me to do anything differently? No. <laughs> the video won't be able to get it, but it's better, right? Yes. So just speak. OK, so I don't have a mic. I just need to speak loudly? Yeah. OK, that's fine. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Good. So much better. So we're going to spend a large part of the time actually talking about the progressive era and it was um, encouraging that Dr. George actually mentioned the progressive era and the social hygienists and eugenics and we're going to be talking about that a little bit too. So it's almost like he had my script. Um, why the progressive era? Well that's because this is where sex education got its start. Before I started really studying this issue, I just assumed that sex education had its genesis during the sexual revolution. Did anybody else think that? Yeah, I hear nods of heads. Yeah, I did too. I certainly didn't think that it would be back in the 1890s and 1880s and around the turn of the century, and yet it was. Well, during this time, there was a movement, and it was an unlikely 
collaboration of partners that rarely work together. You found the medical community, you found clergy, you found public health officials, you found um, elected officials, uh, academia, and the general public all saying our society is going to hell in a handbasket basket, and we have to do something about this. We are at a moral crisis in our country, and we don't know what to do. So they looked at society holistically, and they said there are some things that need to change. We need to clean up corruption in government, and we need to get rid of some of these social ills that are influencing our society and are breaking down our family. Until this time, the whole topic of sex was something that was a casual conversation in the barnyard. Um, and that parents would begrudgingly talk about, and many wouldn't even talk about. Uh, but certainly it was not a part of public conversation. And when it was discussed, it was more, mostly discussed in terms of morality and religion. During this time, we first saw the infusion of science. And instead of purely talking about it in terms of public morals, we talked about it in terms of Let's look at the public health of our nation and what kind of things need to be in place in order to assure that we have optimal public health for our citizenry. And ultimately, the whole goal was to strengthen the family. And one of the first issues that they at attacked was the elimination of the sexual double standard. Does this sound strangely familiar? because that's a debate that's going on today. So here's what it looked like back then. Most held this view. Who, well, the feminist especially held this view. But virtually everyone that was in that coalition held the view, and they said this. During this time, there was this unwritten acceptance that men had a sexual necessity that oftentimes could not be satisfied within the marriage bound. And so while prostitution wasn't legal, neither was it illegal. Because after all, if men had a sexual necessity, there was a reason that we had prostitution, right? Well, those who wanted to do away with this sexual double standard said, if women are called to a, a higher standard of sexual restraint, of abstinence until marriage and fidelity within marriage, well then men should be held to that very same higher standard. There needs to be a uniform sexual standard for men and women. And it's not that this is a decision that only impacts two people. This has a direct impact on society. And, in, and, and beyond that, it has a direct impact on what they called innocents. Who were those innocents? Well, they were the young children who were born with the ravages of syphilis. And it was the wife whose husband had been visiting the prostitutes and was bringing an STD home. So that was the majority view. He said, we need to change the conversation. But there was a countercultural view as well. And some held this view. The most notable person was Margaret Sanger, although there were others. Her name has enduring recognizability, so that's why I used her. And they said we need to eliminate the sexual double standard, but their solution was slightly different. They said, you know what? If men can enjoy sexual freedom, well, then women should be able to enjoy sexual freedom as well. It's just not right that there's a sexual double standard. So they both recognized the problem, but they had very different solutions to that problem. Well, the problem with their solution was that they ignored that there was any import to those decisions that two people would make on society. And they also ignored that it had anything any ramifications to any innocence. 
This was a private matter of two people, and what they did is totally up to them. And not only that, it's healthy to experiment sexually. Well, does that sound a little bit familiar to today? Yeah. So today, sexual freedom reigns supreme. And in fact, while feminists during the progressive era were calling for that uniform sexual restraint, today radical feminists say that those who call for uniform sexual restraint are actually slut shamers, if you've heard that term before. So let's just look at that in the context then of what else was going on during the progressive era. During this same period of time, we had the 16th Amendment and the income tax passed. You think, what on earth does that have to do with reducing vice? Well, up until this time, alcohol and taxes on alcohol helped to keep the federal government wheels turning. If they were looking at eliminating um, and making alcohol illegal, they had to find a different way to bring monies into the federal government. Hence, the income tax. Now, that's not the only reason for it, but that was a driving force behind it. The 17th Amendment. This is all in a very short period of time that all of these amendments passed. Direct election of senators. Prior to that, state legislators chose US senators. And there were backroom deals. And there was corruption. Um, between the State House and the federal government and, and Congress there. And so this amendment said, you know, the people need to choose. We need to eliminate political corruption. Quick on its heels was the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition. And then the 19th Amendment with women's suffrage. Well, at that same time, these same social hygienists said, there needs to be some laws that make prostitution illegal. But before we can really address that, we need to cut off the source of many forced prostitutes. And so many states raised the age of consent. During this time, most states had age of consent from seven to 10 years of age. Think about that. And so they became a, a, a wonderful source for prostitution. And most states then criminalized prostitution, no longer seeing this as a necessary evil. And at the same time, like Dr. George mentioned, um, eugenics was seen as the scientific way to assure that our society got better and better and better. Most states also, for the very first time, started STD notification. And they had education around that as well. And why is that? Well, we'll tell you in a minute. Um, here are some sexual hygiene posters showing that it's holistic. Now, this was right around the time of World War I. Some of these sound familiar as well. So there were posters on nutrition, eating well, on fitness, getting your exercise. One of the questions is, can you walk 10 miles in a day? Medi mental acuity, reading the classics. Um, and then this next poster was, Dis discussing the fact that men have no sexual necessity that is different from women. And then they would show pictures of the innocents. And this was a little boy who had the ravages of syphilis um, on his body. And the goal was to equip young people so that they would, in their words, go into marriage without any of these problems hampering a healthy marriage. But that still doesn't answer the question of why did the federal government get involved? This was a community issue. Well, it was until World War I. Because World War I is the first time that soldiers went across the sea to fight a war. They were away from wives. They were away from parents. No one knew what they were doing, and yet, the estimate was that at least 50% of enlisted military had at least an, uh, one of the two STDs at the time, syphilis or gonorrhea, 50%. It was a matter of national security. How could the person next to you 
protect you in times of war if they were in the later stages of syphilis. They couldn't. And so that's why the federal government first got involved in sex education during the progressive era. Kind of humorous posters here that they distributed. Now there wasn't sex education in the schools yet. It was community-based sex education out of health departments and, and in different community venues. But it informed this debate in that this is the first time the federal government got involved in social issues. And the two models of sex education that we have today, sexual risk avoidance or abstinence education and sexual risk reduction or condom-centered so-called comprehensive sex education, both got their start during this time. One as a general cultural view, which was the sexual risk avoidance abstinence education, and then also that subcultural view among Margaret Sanger and some of her cohorts encouraging the normalization of non-marital sex. So let's just take a, just a few minutes to talk about Margaret Sanger and how she informed sex education. She's the mother of birth control. She's the mother of Planned Parenthood. Most of you probably know that. But she was very, very involved in the beginning of sex education, that countercultural view that normalized sex. And here are some of the principles that she held dear. Here's what she said. Abstinence causes mental disorders and nervousness. And marriage has a degenerating influence on society. Now, if you think about the time period here, this is early 1900s. This was, these were radical statements, very radical statements. So she believed in the elimination of the sexual double standard, but was very much supportive of sexual freedom. And it was the support that she held dearly herself because she did not believe that um, marital fidelity was all that important. A biographer, Ellen Chesler, said this, and this biographer, by the way, is very supportive of the work of Margaret Sanger, and she said this, she perceived herself as fully liberated in her personal and sexual right, life. If you think of pictures from the early 1900s and women and in uh, dresses, you know, up to here, and long dresses, and arms fully covered. These were radical views. During the same period of time, we had the foundation for Planned Parenthood. It wasn't called that at the time, but this is a picture of Margaret Sanger's first birth control clinic. There were three people that got this started, by and large. Margaret, her sister, and a friend, only three. Now they had some funding and they had some help in that regard, but those three started this because they thought that if women were going to be able to be free of some of the consequences of multiple birth, but also free to engage in, in sexual freedom, um, birth control was the way to go. The only problem was that information distribution of birth control was illegal during this time. And so within days of it opening, she was in prison while in jail. And so that's a picture of Margaret being arrested. The reason I bring this up is this was a countercultural view at the time, and yet she believed so strongly in it that she was willing to go to jail for her beliefs. The views we could argue that we hold in terms of the proper um, sex education and what we believe about the, the, the proper time for sex and what it should look like, that's countercultural now too, right? She was undeterred, and her countercultural voice is now the dominant cultural voice. That should encourage us. It was her tenacity and then bringing those alongside her that helped give this um, success over the course of many years. So she also had uh, the Women Rebel, which was a, a kind of a newsprint um, 
publication, and here's what she said there. A man and woman should be permitted to give expression to their love or perpetuate the race without the necessity of a public declaration of marriage. So she really was an outlier, and she wasn't an outlier because of her views on eugenics, just like uh, Dr. George said. That was a, a view held by most. The enlightened class all supported eugenics. But her view of marriage was an outlier view. Her view of sexual freedom and merely reducing the consequences, that was definitely an outlier view. And her ambivalence towards abortion um, prompted her view that contraception was the best way to avoid it. So now let's fast forward a little bit to the Roaring Twenties. And I am going to suggest that this is really our first sexual revolution. So this is an actual picture from the 20s. Look at how risque. I mean, I can even see this woman's underwear. So if we go from the 1910s with long dresses and everything covered to pictures like this, you saw that something has happened in the interim. And so here was a movie star. And you can see this is very provocative for the, the era. Um, and so the invention of movies, it really played into the sexual liberation because you may or may not know that during the 1920s there was full frontal nudity in some of these movies. That was shocking to me. Is it shocking to any of you? Surprise. And that's what gave rise to the movie industry needing to put some kind of guidelines on the movies was because of what was happening here during the 20s. Women had the right to vote, and prohibition made uh, alcohol illegal. And yet, more women drank during prohibition than at any other time previous in history. Freud was gaining prominence, and so the whole issue of being free to pursue our libido um, really became a part of that flapper conversation. And so here was sheet music, popular music during the time, and here's one of the lines. She isn't like her mother, and yet she might have been if it hadn't been for petting parties, cigarettes, and gin. Really? Aren't you surprised? I'm shocked. I was shocked. Well, there was a lot of backlash as a result. And so sex education in the schools, time had not come. But there was a general um, chipping away at the view of what is appropriate conduct in terms of sex outside of marriage and what is not. So now we come to the 1948, and Alfred Kinsey writes his famous book, Sexual Behavior of the Human Male. This book was on the banned book list. What happens when anything's on the banned book list, right? Everyone wants to read it and see what's in there. Well, Alfred Kinsey's research was not serious science. So most of the things that he drew as conclusions have been discounted, and yet they form the basis for many of the tenants of comprehensive or condom-centered education today. And here's what he had to say about delaying sex until marriage. He said, only celibacy, delayed marriage, and asceticism are cultural perversions. Sounds very similar to the quote we heard from the progressive era from the subcultural voices. And here's what his colleague, Paul Gebhard, who helped write one of the books, said, Kinsey felt that neither male nor female was inherently monogamous, and it was just a pity that sex had to be constrained and unnecessarily restricted. It didn't much matter what you did sexually, as long as it didn't hurt anyone else, and it made you and your partner happy. Does that sound familiar to what we hear today? Indeed, it does. Now, of course, when he's talking about you and your partner, one of his tenets is that we are sexual from birth, and he thought that sexual response was possible even in infants. What was possible even in infants? Sexual response. And so, you know, m many would argue that his research today 
could land researchers you know, in prison for illegal activities, to put it mildly. So Kinsey and Sanger didn't know one another well at all. However, Kinsey did use the Sanger Institute to do conduct some of his research and gathered al almost 200 sex histories from then. And here is what Sanger said after that was completed. You're certainly to be congratulated on the splendid work you are doing. Now you have to know each of these operators that I'm mentioning were all countercultural voices. During all of this time, the expectation was that now men and women would wait until marriage before having sex, and there was the expectation that there was fidelity within marriage. But these countercultural voices were, were gaining speed. And so as a result of Kinsey, we had a new social science, and that was the creation of sexology, or the scientific study of sexual behavior. And in his challenging and revolutionizing many of the assumptions that we had up until this point about human sexual behavior, it didn't much matter that they have been debunked. Most of them persist, and so we began to see a sea change. So now it takes us to the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, where most people would think that the history of sex education began. Well, the difference between the first sexual revolution and this second sexual revolution is that now the countercultural activities were done in public rather than in private. And what were some of the results of the sexual revolution? Well, there was this new morality. Joseph Fletcher and situation ethics. Are any of you familiar with that? These Christians, they were the last holdouts on seeing that sexual freedom was really the enlightened view. And so Joseph Fletcher said, and this is overly simplistic, I will say, um, Christians, you're reading your Bible wrong. There is nothing implicit or explicit in the Bible that prohibits sexual expression outside of the bounds of marriage. What is right for one person may be wrong for the next and vice versa. And in fact, the only, only underlying determinant of what is right and wrong is whether it's love. It's propelled and motivated by love. And so this had some playing within the Christian community. Not all, but some. What's interesting, though, is that Joseph Fletcher, I believe, was an Episcopal priest. Before his death, he disavowed his Christian beliefs, became an atheist, and his wife worked for many, many years with Margaret Sanger. So you see this thread continuing throughout history. Okay, another result was the movement from risk avoidance to risk reduction. So during the progressive era, 50% of enlisted men had an STD. What was the best prescription to avoid that? Don't have sex, right? Because penicillin had not yet been invented. Well, now we had penicillin to treat most of the STDs, and now we also had the pill. And if the pill failed, then we also had abortion. And through a series of Supreme Court um, determinate decisions, the pill became very quickly accessible, first only to married couples. In a very short period of time, it became a right for teenagers without parental notification. And so you can see that we, we're having a, a big shift in erasing some of the consequences of sex without addressing the core issues. During the same time, we had the passage of Title X, which is the very first funding stream simply for family planning. And very quickly thereafter, um, there was money set aside specifically for teens. And President Johnson gave money to 
organizations to begin comprehensive sex education in communities across the country. And this was in the 60s and the 70s. So this was still a countercultural view, but look at how attitudes and behavior changed. From 1963 to 1970, the acceptability of premarital sex doubled. Now you think, well, okay, sex doubled, but we have a solution to all the consequences, right? Because we've got the pill and we've got abortion. Well, non-marital births also doubled during that same period of time. And this is a graph from the CDC that showed that within four years, there was a 165% increase in STDs among young adults. So even though it was still a subcultural view, it was taking hold in the general culture. During this same time, the very first organization that was totally devoted to sex education, to normalizing teen sex, came on the scene, and that was CECAS. Interestingly, it was begun by Mary Calderon, who was the medical director of Planned Parenthood. And its funding received partial funding from the Playboy Foundation. Now, Secus thought that sex was great and that, yes, we could teach values, but it's not the no values related to sex, according to Mary Calderon. It's the yes values. Now remember, we're not talking about adults here. We're talking about young people in sex education classes in middle and high school. And so here is their national impact. They were the first comprehensive organization. And so now we had an organization that spent all of their time promoting sexual debut for teens. Unlike Planned Parenthood, who had divided loyalties, SECUS was only devoted to sex education. And we had increased funding for sex education teacher training. And here is what one of the presidents of SECUS said. It's not the wedding band that makes sex moral, but whether that relationship is consensual, non-exploitive, honest, mutually pleasurable, and protected. Sounds very similar again to today, right? Well, everything changed with the discovery of AIDS. Now the pill was no longer the miracle drug because now we had this disease that was killing and no one knew exactly why. How did that impact sex education? Well, the priority moved from pregnancy prevention now to life preservation. And this pluralistic debate about sex education, should it be avoiding risk and waiting for sex until marriage, or should it be reducing risk and making sure that people don't get pregnant or now don't get AIDS? Federal funds for sexual risk reduction, AIDS prevention skyrocketed. But we also saw during this time the very first funding specifically for sexual risk avoidance abstinence education. Fast forward now to uh, the tenure of President Clinton and we had welfare reform. And this is the first time that abstinence education really became a national emphasis throughout the country. Why? It's because Congress saw that there was something that was very similar uh, among many people who found themselves on government assistance, and it was that they were single parents, and usually moms, and that the children were growing up in poverty. And so Congress said, what if instead of just putting money to fighting poverty after it already occurs, what if we could actually address it before it occurred? And so looking at the social science research that was available at that time, they said if we could encourage abstinence until marriage, this would help young people to become self-sufficient, take personal responsibility for themselves, and not bear children outside of marriage. And so that's where federal funding for abstinence education really first got started. And they saw this real linkage between sexual risk avoidance education and poverty prevention. 
And actually, the Brookings Institute, not long ago, 2009, if you're not familiar with this research, it's really worth the read. Here's the summary. The Brookings Institute said this. Young people have only a 2% chance of, of living their adult lives in poverty if they do these three things. Number one, graduate from high school. Number two, get a full-time job. And number three, wait until they're at least 21 and married before having children. Now, have you ever thought of sex education in terms of poverty prevention? Do you know of any deterrent to poverty that's more effective than 98%? This is pretty impressive, right? Well, during the time of welfare reform under President Clinton, we didn't have all of this data, but they had enough to know that there was a connection. So it takes us to today, where we have a very minimalistic view of what sex education should look like. It's a return to pregnancy prevention as its primary emphasis. So the view is, it doesn't much matter if teens engage in sex with as many partners as they desire as long as they are careful and use a condom or contraception and avoid pregnancy. And that's where most taxpayer dollars for sex education are going today. In fact, when President Clinton took off, I mean, when President Obama took office, he eliminated every dollar for sexual risk avoidance abstinence education with his very first budget that he sent to Congress. One of the things that NAEA does is works on both sides of the aisle. And we convinced some members of Congress to vote against the president, even members on the Democratic side, and reinstate a small portion of that. But even so, about 94% of all tax dollars going to sex education in the federal budget go to explicit sex education that normalizes teen sex. So, so the emphasis is no longer looking at sex holistically for teens in terms of how it might impact poverty and their social and psychological, any of those impacts, only pregnancy, and to a lesser degree, STDs, but not even that much. We've really gone backwards, we would argue. What I hope that you can take from, from this is that there is a historical perspective that should really encourage us, and that is previous countercultural voices are now the dominant voice. So what is to say that your countercultural voice cannot be the dominant voice? We think it's as bad as it ever was, but if we look at history, it was pretty bad, right? And yet, there were forces in history, and often small numbers, who effected that huge, tremendous change. Second thing is, sex education themes have this way of repeating themselves. And so we see them today as we saw them decades before. And, it, and, and this is not a simplistic issue. It's about a whole lot more than teen pregnancy, isn't it? It should be. And that's how we discuss it. And as I mentioned, think back to Margaret Sanger. Three people, Margaret, her sister, and a friend got it started. There are many more of you here today. Never underestimate your ability. I will say NAEA is not a large organization. We don't have a huge budget. But we were able to convince members of Congress to change their vote, even though they, that meant voting against their president, who they supported. It's not numbers. It's how we articulate and how effective we are in that messaging. So I want to issue a challenge, and then we'll open this up to questions. Think of it as possible rather than impossible. Two challenges for you. The first. And this is a rhetorical question. Do you believe there's something better for your generation? 
Yes? <laughs> so maybe you haven't considered this, or maybe you have. You can be that game changer. And I am not trying to be oversimplistic. The stories I can share of how God has intervened with very few numbers are amazing, but it takes us to be willing to be that person. You can be the culture changer. There's one opportunity that I'd like you to consider, and that is there are members of Congress that can be reached by you. I have had more than one member of Congress say, I will never turn down a meeting with a young person from my state. I want to hear from them. Every year we have an abstinence day on the Hill. It's going to be March or April. We don't know exactly when because the congressional calendar for 2015 hasn't come out. What does this day on the Hill look like? Well, it looks pretty similar to what Planned Parenthood does and Advocates for Youth do, where they have young people your age, articulate, intelligent, good looking, come to the halls of Congress and say, we demand our sexual rights. Guess how many young people come and say, we think we're worth more than that? Very few, a handful, if that. We'd like to change that. And I would like to encourage you to consider being one of those people that we would set up a meeting with your senator and your member of Congress. We'll train you. We'll make all of the arrangements. You just have to find a way to get there. We will also request a meeting with the White House. About a month ago, we requested that a meeting and brought some young people to the White House, met with the president's chief policy person on this issue. And at the end of that hour, that policy person said, I have never heard this described in this way, and this is very compelling. Now, they haven't changed policy yet, but an election just happened. And I've been told we have two years to affect major policy changes and we cannot waste those two years. So I would encourage you to consider joining us. If you're interested in knowing more, there's gonna be a makeshift sign-up sheet that we're just gonna sign along. It doesn't obligate you to anything, it's just, yeah, I'd like to learn more. Or you can go on 2015.dayonthehill.weebly.com or talk to me. So that's the first thing you can do. The second thing, do you ever feel like you're the lone voice on your college campus? <laughs> or maybe a very, very minority voice? Some students can only be reached by you. There's been some recent research done that shows this whole, this whole issue of sexual freedom is a lie. This research done at the University of Penn, here's one quote. Women said universally that hookups could not exist without alcohol because they were too uncomfortable to pair off with men they did not know well enough without being drunk. So that's consent, but consent under the influence, which we know can't be consent. But it makes it a little difficult to know, right? And another one, this one on Harvard. Women are so far from wanting hookups that they must drink themselves into drunken consent, not having a sociable drink, but getting blind drunk in today's preliminary to sex. Beautifully romantic, isn't it? So your friends, your roommates, who may be hooking up every weekend and you think they are okay with that, well maybe they are and maybe they're not. And maybe you can reach them. Here's another, um, this is Virgin Territories uh, research. You can go on the national campaign site. Most young adults, if they're given the choice, they want romance, not sex. That same study said young adults want to know that waiting to have sex is in, quite, in fact quite normal. This was the majority view. There's a real opportunity that you have on your campus as well. Maybe you can be that next chapter of sexuality history. I am just so honored to spend time with 
who I know are going to be the next leaders. This has been such an honor to be here, and I look forward to working with you, not just in the future, but today. So. So I'm open to any questions or comments that you may have. So the question was, what can we do? <laughs> well, these are two illustrations. Um, be genuine and be caring, first of all, to those on, on your campus. What I found is there is a longing in the heart for love. There is a longing in the heart for authentic relationships. And oftentimes, people look in the wrong places. And if they see someone who truly and is genuinely interested in them, and they're not looking or judging what they're doing, they're seeing them beyond that. I had story after story where where people have changed dramatically as a result. So that's one thing. A second thing is we need young people, especially those who are considering going into the medical profession or into education, to really be equipped to communicate um, about this issue in the public sphere, not using talking points that only work with our faith perspective or from a moral grounding. I'm a committed Christian, but I talk about this topic in terms of public health and what does the data tell us, because that is compelling to those who may or may not have a faith perspective. And in order to affect real change in a policy manner, we have to be able to speak in language that resonates with our audience. And we haven't been very good at doing that. The first line of contraception for young girls, talking, you know, 13 to 18, should be long-term contraception, things like IUDs um, and rods. How does that affect um, sort of the, the difference between absence-only education and sex education that's based on contraception when it seems like we're moving away from the just take a daily pill, just take a condom, versus now these invasive things where we're not really sure how they affect young girls' bodies? So yes, we um, issued a press release when that went out. We were mortified that a group of physicians who at its heart should have the best health interests of, of their patients in mind would ignore um, what their counsel could, could affect on a whole population. And it's about more than whether or not we're philosophically in agreement to LARC or long-acting um, long reversible contraception. It has very much to do with the very last um, segment of the history of sex ed, and that is us minimizing teen sex merely to pregnancy prevention. What are some ramifications that we can expect to see? Now, it's too early to, to know for sure, but it's not just that, you, that um, organization that is promoting that. The federal government is also promoting that. And under Obamacare, uh, anyone can get contraception without any copay. And so now, things like LARC, which are quite expensive, now are at no cost to the person who seeks them. And so every, all of these things are in place to make the argument for LARC. What do you think that's going to do to the number of sexual partners a person has if they don't have to worry about the possibility of getting pregnant? What is that going to do to what is already an ap epidemic of sexually transmitted disease and infection? We need to have an honest discussion here that goes beyond the political easy talking points. I was in a meeting um, in the White House, this is at the beginning of the Obama administration, actually with the head of that organization. 
and even at that time, he was not at all supportive of sexual delay. Um, and after this roundtable discussion in the White House, I pulled him aside and I said, perhaps um, you're not familiar with this information and this research that shows the effectiveness of sexual risk avoidance abstinence programs and how important it is that the medical community encourage young people to delay sex for as long as they can. What struck me and was really discouraging at, at the same time is here is the president of an organization that represents physicians across the country who not only had his facts wrong, but had a political agenda above a health agenda. So when I say it's noise versus numbers, this is not an easy task. And indeed, when NAEA was formed, there were friendly people who said, why would you start an organization? Abstinence education is a vestige of the past, and it is going to be going away. And yet, what do we see? The majority of teens are not having sex, and the majority of those who have wish they hadn't. That's a great opening, right, for a choice that's different from what they're currently doing. And the fact that those numbers are moving in the right direction, even though our culture is becoming more sexualized, that, could that should cause us to be encouraged. Because even though the adults in these teens' lives aren't believing that they can make the healthiest decisions, more of them are. Think if there was a chorus reinforcing those healthy decisions, what we would see. It would be amazing. This is not a losing, it does not need to be a losing battle. Yes? My name is Lamar, I'm from the, the Culture Project International. And, and part, of my, part of the work that I do is actually speaking, the employee and adults to speak to high school students about mm -hmm. sexual integrity. And, awesome. Um, it's, it, it is. Uh, and what, the question I have is really like, when I think back about when I was in high school, and I would receive formation in kind of sexual education. I went to a Catholic high school, um, and even even in, in that school at that time, the formation that I received as far as abstinence was don't have sex um, because it's wrong, or because you shouldn't do that, or because sex is bad, or all these different reasons that I think abstinence kind of is a stereotype for, as you've mentioned as well, it's a negative stereotype. And parts of this presentation were actually really enlightening for me and refreshing to hear. I won't lie. Um, Part of my formation also is in this idea of virtue, and sexual integrity, this virtue of, that a lot of people call chastity. And I'm curious because uh, when I think of chastity, and when we talk about chastity to a group of students, we look at it in a, in a light that's different than you know, um, maybe some of the ideas that were presented in this presentation, but that are more of like, a, understanding sex as like a sacrificial offering of self to another, as a free gift. Trying to avoid religion and faith, kind of like you said. My question is, could you define abstinence for me in a way that you would define it to a high school group? And do you see a difference between abstinence and chastity? Uh, because what you're talking about is very appealing to me. It almost seems like we're talking about the same thing in our respective arenas. And, and I would just, I would love to hear what you think about that. Okay, so true confession here. Um, we don't use the word chastity, and we are moving away from the word abstinence. And the reason for that is because of the baggage attached to both of those terms in the public arena. If young people and policymakers already have in their mind this stereotype of what it was, that means we're spending way too much time correcting things before we can ever start doing what we want to do. So we're actually in the process of rebranding even our organization. I, I think what you're saying is we need to inspire, encourage, empower, and equip young people. And that's what our programs are doing. When I hear young people, when they come to Washington, I have to give you just one story. So as a, a uh, young boy, his father was an NBA or an FL star, I can't remember which. Second string, so unfortunately, you know, I couldn't ask for an autograph or anything for my kids. But, so his dad got hooked on drugs, lived in New York City, abandoned his wife, abandoned his kids, three kids. 
this kid was a middle schooler at the time, and he got hooked up with a um, gang in New York City. He was about 12 years old, stole his first car. So mom was really concerned that this is not going to go well for my son if we stay here. So they moved. They moved back to her home in Arkansas. Well, guess what? You know, you can change the location and you can change the friends, but pretty soon you he found the same kind of friends he had in New York City. The mentoring sexual risk avoidance abstinence program in his school saw promise in him and told him that. And it wasn't just about don't have sex, it was helping him see his life differently. Helping him see that he has value and he has a future. As a result of that, he left his friends, he got a new set of friends who had these different views, and these mentors helped him. And he told me, they actually saved my life, literally. Because those friends that I was hanging with, they're now in prison, first degree murder. They were a part of a campus shooting in Arkansas. And he said, I know for certain that had it not been your program, I would have been there as well. I know for sure. It had very little to do about sex. It had everything to do about setting a focus on the future, learning how to make healthy decisions, delayed gratification, all of those things that are essential to human thriving. That's why this is a message that is resonating with young people, even though our culture is becoming more highly sexualized. So I think we are on the same page. Long response. Sorry about Thank that. You very much. Yeah. So I think we have room time for a couple more questions, if anyone has any. Yes. So the question is, is it even possible to have this message in the public school? And the answer is absolutely yes. I will say, however, that certain regions of the country are easier, certain regions are more difficult. But we have members in the very liberal states and the very conservative states, and they talk about it differently, but the essential criteria for what they teach does not differ. So one of the things NAEA does um, is we have a credential certification for anyone who wants to teach it, and we talk about messaging, how to know your audience, how to gain acceptance in the community, know it, how to find out what kind of things resonate And, you know, this is, this definitely is winnable. And here's how I know this. About a year ago, we used an independent research firm. And we, we, we conducted um, a nationally representative sample of parents. No, it wasn't even parents. Of, of likely voters and, you know, citizens. And we oversampled Republicans and Democrats. We oversampled African American, Hispanic, and Caucasian people because we wanted to see what, if any, differences there were among those cohorts. And here's what we found. Overwhelmingly, the things that are a part of a sexual risk avoidance abstinence program, they were supported by Democrats, Republicans, Caucasians, Hispanics, African Americans, overwhelmingly. People say, oh, you can't use the M word anymore. One of the top uh, questions where there was the greatest consensus was, when do you want your child to have sex? All of those groups said, we want them to wait until marriage. The, the other high um, measure of consensus was the question of, do you want your children to recognize that even with the use of a condom, risk there are risks inherent with that? Overwhelmingly, yes. I mean, it was like almost 90%, I think. I don't have it in front of me. Very high. So we're on the right side of this. Definitely, we're on the right side of this. Yes? My name is Kate, and we're both public health majors at Brave University. And public health field is not class. So 
so the question was, um, well, I'm going to say it's two-part, even though you didn't make it a two-part. The first part was, uh, in the public health arena, uh, you believe this is important, even though public health um, professionals don't necessarily agree with you. And the second is, um, what do you say to those who say that this is not even a viable option because it's sex is a sexual right for everyone? So the first thing is we talk about this from a public health standpoint. And if you look at those public health paradigms of how we message risk avoidance versus risk reduction, addressing the myriad of risk behaviors for especially young people, but not just young people, it's really our message that fits into the public health paradigm. It's not the normalization of sex. That's counter the public health paradigm. And when I bring that up to, to public health officials at the highest levels at US Department of Health and Human Services, they might not go from zero to 100% in agreement, but you can see that light bulb going off like, oh, there's a cognitive dissonance here. And I love it. <laughs> the second thing is, that's a pretty, e that's a pretty, e the second part of your question is, what if they say it's not reasonable? Well, they may say that for them, but they can't make those statements without looking at the data, and the data is painting a much different picture. So I think we still have time for another one or two. Yes. Yes, so the question is, it wasn't stated just this way, so forgive me. So I agree with abstinence education, but does it work? Um, what do I tell people who want to know because they say there's no research showing that it works? Is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah, OK. Not as eloquently as you stated it, but. I love to get that question because it's so easy to blow out of the water. and. Um, <laughs> So if you go on our website, which is the NAEA.org, every year we put together um, a short booklet called Abstinence Works. And I think there are 23 peer-reviewed studies in there right now of abstinence education programs across the country that have um, statistically significant positive behavioral impact. And it, they fall into three categories, number one, uh, students are more likely to delay sex if they're a part of our programs. Number two, those who are already sexually experienced are more likely to either discontinue that sexual activity or at the very least reduce their number of partners, moves it in the right direction. And although we don't have condom demonstrations or pass out condoms, we do say contraception can reduce your risk, but it's not going to eliminate it. And so all of our focus is on how to be successful in avoiding sex, uh, but we want to give information about contraception so they don't have a false sense of security. But the research shows that the students who go on to be sexually active, they're no less likely to use a condom or contraception. It's not like the only information they ever get is from our programs. The reason I love to cite that information is because those are the points that our opponents use against us all the time. And the, the data in abstinence works has changed policy in states. And it has changed the minds of policymakers at the local and the federal level. A lot of people, they just want to help kids. They want to do what they think is right. And sometimes they've only heard one side of this. And they haven't heard it articulated in a way that directly responds to the attacks of our critics. And so all of those attacks that our critics give, they're very easy to respond to with accuracy. And that's why um, NAEA is the primary media spokes organization. It's not like I'm great in public speaking. It's not like I love to debate, which I don't. But we rarely lose a debate and it's not because we're that great. It's because we have the facts and we know that they are not very creative. They have tired, worn out arguments that are very easy to disregard and to shine truth on their faults. So, it's, so 
I think we are out of time. I'm going to stay after. I'm going to be here for the rest of the time. I'd love to talk to you if you'd like my card. If you haven't signed up and you might be interested, um, please make sure you do that for Day on the Hill. You've been great. Thank you very much. <laughs>